River City family. So great to have you joining us this morning. My name is Eddie Diaz. I'm one of the pastors here at River City, and I want to start by saying happy Father's Day to all the fathers out there at Rev City Online. Listen, we're about counting down to our service, getting ready to get started. So I want to do, do me a favor. Gather together. Let's gather together and worship as a church family. So gather your family, your friends, everybody that's surrounding you, and tell them, come on, let's get ready for church. We've always loved seeing all the places that people from all over the world join in to watch Rev City Online. So do me a favor and uh, get put your name in there. Tell us where you're watching from, what city you're at, what town you're at. Even if you're here in Lawrence, say, hey, I'm here in Lawrence. Let us know where you're watching from. Give us a shout out. We want to give you a shout out as well. Be sure that you stay involved in that chat feature. That lets us know how many people are engaging online and really helps us out with our algorithm. Also, I want to let you know that beyond just participating and viewing the service, we want you to feel connected here at River City Online. Our heart for you is to belong to a church family. So if you have not done this already, we want to connect with you. And so you can type the word Rev City to the number 94,000 and let us know that you want to get connected. You fill out a very quick connect form and this will help us to get you engaged and involved in Rev City Online. More than just watching online, we want you to feel like you're a participant and a member of our church family. We want you to feel welcomed, to feel valued, and to feel cared for. So please do me that favor. Fill out that Connect card. Let us know where you're watching from, and that will really help greatly for our ability to be able to pastor you as we move forward. Listen, if you have a prayer request, that same text feature is also a great way to do that. Just type the Rev City to 94,000. Give us your prayer request. I will call you this week and pray with you on your behalf on whatever's going on in your life. So we want to make sure, again, even though you can't be here, that you know that you're taken care of. Listen, for those of you hosting watch parties, thank you so much for opening up your home and allowing people to come in. And if you want to host a watch party wherever you're at and have people come to your house and watch services together, let us know and we'll get you connected on that. Facebook, like that page. Subscribe to the page on YouTube, subscribe to Rev City Online, and let us know that you're a part of our family. Well, it's about time for the service to get started, so let's go into the sanctuary and get ready for worship. We'll see you on the other side. God bless. Aren't you glad to be in the house of the Lord? Isn't it good to praise Him this morning? Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Lord, you inhabit the praises of your people. Would you inhabit this place?
lying in me I once was lost but now I'm found was blind but
may be going through in life right now, but God says to count it all joy. Count it as an opportunity to build your faith, faith in what only He can do in your life, for you and through you, for the kingdom of God. So give Christ, Jesus, our Savior, another round of applause for what He's going to do today, tomorrow, in the future. Thank you, Lord. Thank you so much for joining us today. Please be seated as we check out what's going on in Red City. you're here today. Check out these upcoming events. BBS is this week. It's not too late to sign up. We will be blasting off into our theme for the week. Stellar. Shine Jesus's light. Registration is open at revcity.com slash BBS for volunteers and kids ages three through those entering fifth grade. Get ready for Summer Slam on Wednesday, July 12th from 6 to 8 p.m. Bring your whole family for an evening of food, games, and fellowship. Each family is asked to bring either a covered side dish or a dessert to share. Rev City will provide drinks, hot dogs, and chips. We'll see you there. Bullet Conference is June 27th through 29th. All 6th through 12th grade students are invited to attend this opportunity to dive deeper into the relationship with God through worship, prayer, and time in His Word. Register online at revcity.com slash youth or text the word revcityyouth to the number 94000. If you recently dedicated or rededicated your life to Jesus, sign up for water baptisms on Sunday, July 16th. Use our text feature or our website to sign up. Be sure to like, follow, and subscribe to Rev City Church on social media. You'll find tons of encouragement, updates on our upcoming events, and have access to all our sermon series and Sunday services. Thank you for joining us today. We hope you enjoy the rest of our service and have a great day with Jesus. Happy Father's Day, everyone. My name is Micah Barclay, and I'm one of the pastors here at Rev City Church. We're going to continue our worship through bringing our tithes and giving our heart for the kingdom and legacy offerings. As we take this day and celebrate fathers and men alike, I want to encourage all of us that regardless of what your earthly relationship looked like or looks like with your earthly father, that you have a father in heaven who loves you. John 3, 1 says, See how much our Father loves us, for He calls us His children, and that is what we are. Ephesians 4, 5 through 6 says, There is one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God, Father of all, who is over all, in all, and living through all. 2 Corinthians 6, 18 says, And I will be your Father, and you will be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. Not only do we have a Father in Heaven that loves us, but you have a Father in Heaven who longs to give you good gifts. Matthew 7, 11 says, So if you sinful people know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Heavenly Father give you good gifts to those who ask Him? Luke 11, 11 says, You fathers, if your children ask you for a fish, do you give them a snake instead? And finally, James 1:17 says, Whatever is good and perfect is a gift coming down to us from God our Father. Father. Church, you have to know that your Heavenly Father loves you. He desires you and longs to give you good gifts. He didn't even hold back His own Son from us, but gave us the greatest gift in history, Jesus Christ. As we prepare to bring our tithes and offerings, I want us to be reminded of this truth. God gave us His one and only Son, and yet, who has not struggled to give back to this perfect Father at least some point in our life? Listen, we don't have to try to earn God's favor. The Bible says that while we're still sinners, Christ died for us. But I want to challenge everyone here today to step out and give like our Heavenly Father has given to us. To be perfect like our Father in Heaven is perfect. He didn't hold anything back from us and we shouldn't hold anything back from Him either. I believe that when we commit to this type of generosity and stewardship, God will not only bless us, but we will truly be walking in our Father's footsteps. To bring your tithes and offerings, you can text the word Rev City to the number 94,000. 
Visit RevCity.com slash give, or you can give in person today by dropping your tithes and offerings in the boxes located at each sanctuary exit. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the opportunity to give. We are so grateful that you gave to us first. You didn't even hold back your own son for our benefit. I pray that we would be generous with our finances and give as freely as we have been given. Now, I ask that you bless these tithes and offerings in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, happy Father's Day to all the men. Whether you're a biological father or desiring to someday be a father, or whether you've stepped into or are going to step into what the Bible's real clear about, the role of being a spiritual father to the next generation to model and encourage and guide and shape the next generation to be Christ followers, we want to say happy Father's Day to all the men. Come on, give the guys a hand this morning. We'll pray for you later on in the service, and we've got a special gift. It's a token of just our appreciation for who you are and what you do that we will put in your hands as you leave this morning. But just know we honor you today. If you have your Bible with you, turn to John chapter 14. John chapter 14 and Luke chapter 15 are the two chapters that we'll dig into the most. A lot of God's word in the message today. I'm always looking to just let the word of God do the preaching when I can. And we'll read quite a bit of those chapters and unpack a really powerful principle. I paraphrase the parable that we'll visit in Luke 15 almost every week. When we give people the opportunity to say yes to Jesus or come back home to their heavenly father, prodigal sons and daughters, wayward ones who have drifted from God. And so I, I paraphrase that this parable that we're going to read this morning a lot, but I realized I've never really dug into it and preached upon it. And so we're going to do that today in a message that I'm calling the prodigal father. And I know we referenced that parable a lot as the prodigal son. I'll dig into it. I'll show you why I believe it's also applicable to call it the prodigal father when we get there here in a moment. So once again, just thankful for all you guys and all you dads, all the ways that you serve and, and, and are a blessing to your families and to your kids. You know, family is God's design. Family is God's design. It's, it's God's plan right from the start. He created a marriage and he created family when he said, be fruitful and multiply. And it's no reason that family, the biblical structure of family is under attack in our culture today because it's one of the, the clear mandates from God. It's part of his origins, it's part of his design, it's part of his plan for humanity. And so it's no wonder that it's under attack. And part of why we're called Rev City Church, there's a lot of substance to why we're called Rev City Church. We wanna see revival in our city as people are revived to life in Christ, as we as a church body reveal Jesus to them. We wanna see reverence for God's word and for God himself restored back to our culture. Come on, how many believe we need that to, to happen in our culture? The word rev in and of itself implies energy and enthusiasm, increased activity, especially in anticipation of a coming event, the return of Christ. But there's also something that we stand for as a church, and that's that we desire to see and to be a revolution of faith and family. A revolution of faith and family. And so more than just kind of the way that we... we brought substance to the name Rev City Church or the Lord brought substance to Rev City Church. Family's important to God. Family's important to God. And seeing family restored, seeing a revolution of faith and family restored is near and dear to the heart of God. So in Malachi chapter four, there's a prophetic scripture in verse six that speaks of the future coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. And it talks about the message that would bring about the coming of Jesus Christ. And it talks about this message in, in verse 6, Malachi 4. It says, his preaching will turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the hearts of the children to their fathers. And if you go back and just read a couple verses before that, the context is clearly anticipation and preparation for the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. And it says, otherwise, I will strike the land with a curse. And so God's not looking to curse. He's looking to bless. But what he's saying is that, when family is degraded, when family disintegrates, when the hearts of fathers and the hearts of children are far from one another, it can't help but go bad for that land, for that people, for that nation. And we look around and you don't even have to look for biblical sources, you can look for secular sources who point to fatherlessness as the root issue for many of the problems that plague our society. 
And so God's saying, I'm calling for the hearts of fathers to be returned to the children and children to the fathers. So that's an, that's an Old Testament prophecy about the future coming of the Lord Jesus Christ that then is revisited in Matthew chapter 1. Turn the page, New Testament. In fact, right from the start, New Testament, the first book of the New Testament, verse 17, and we see this revisited when it's speaking of John the Baptist, who was the one who was called to come and prepare the way for the coming of the Lord. And once again, it references what kind of message would be associated with the coming of the Lord. And, and you might think that there are many things that God would highlight, feature, emphasize when speaking of the coming of the Lord and the preparation for his return. But watch what it says once again. It says, he will be a man with the spirit and power of Elijah, and he will prepare the people for the coming of the Lord. How? He will turn the hearts of the fathers to their children, cause those who are rebellious to return, to accept the wisdom of the godly. So we want to be a revolution of faith and family, and it's obvious that God is about seeing reconciliation, restoration, and the strengthening of family, the hearts of of children and fathers turning to one another again. So it's no wonder, if it's so important to God, can we agree that it's important to God? It's, it's the message that's emphasized with the coming or the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. So it's important to God. So if it's that important to God, and we can agree upon that easily, can we also understand that this maybe fits at the top of that category of things that I'm continually telling you guys, where there's power, potential, or promise in your life of faith, in God's kingdom, you gotta just expect there's gonna be opposition. And, and perhaps nothing is being opposed more in our culture today, in society today, than marriage and family. And, and so you could just make up your mind to anticipate opposition, but understand that when you run into opposition and obstacles as you're endeavoring to do marriage, to do family, to raise those kids, to know and love and serve and fear the Lord Jesus Christ, all kinds of obstacles, all kinds of pitfalls, all kinds of opposition to living that life, that you can understand that that's a fight worth fighting. And you can understand that when you are endeavoring to be married in a godly way that brings God honor and brings God glory, when you're endeavoring to raise a godly family, to not just believe in God, but to know and love and serve the Lord Jesus Christ, that you are accomplishing, you are fulfilling, you are standing for something that is very near and dear to the heart of God, something that was established and ordained right from the very start. And it's our opportunity to understand this is worth fighting for. But come on, to do it, we gotta be a people of God's word. We gotta be a people of prayer. We gotta be co committed to and surrendered to the lordship of Jesus Christ, to the fellowship of the saints, because doing marriage and family is hard. Marriage and family is under attack. Masculinity is under attack in our culture today. Masculinity is under attack in our culture. And I'm not just talking about the stereotypes of what it looks like to be a man. But what I am talking about it's the way that God has generally wired men to be, that the culture is pushing back on, that men are meant to be providers, protectors, adventurous, daring, bold, courageous, to blaze trails, to forge the way, to fight for our families and for the, the kingdom of God. Jesus is the lion and the lamb. He, he, he's, he's the servant and the king. And I don't know about you, but what I believe is that more than anything we need in our culture, an uprising of men who will stand and be and become like Jesus in the pattern and model and his example, humble yet bold, fierce yet faithful. Come on, if you believe that we need an uprising of godly men who are humble and bold and fierce and faithful, give the Lord some praise. So for Father's Day is a day of honor and appreciation and celebration for many of us, but for some of us, it might be a day that's associated with maybe just abuse, neglect, or regret. And so here's what I want to encourage you with. For those of you who had godly fathers, there's no perfect father, but for those of you who had godly good fathers who were present and, and, and providing for and encouraging you in your life and in your walk of faith, don't take it for granted. Don't take it for granted. If they're still alive, make sure that you reach out to them and tell them how much you appreciate that even in their imperfection that they were endeavoring to serve God and to serve your family and to provide for your family. But for those of you who did not have a godly example, did not have a godly father, let me encourage you with this. Maybe you had a distant father. Maybe you had a demanding or a heavy-handed father. Maybe you had a father who only extended performance-based affection. In other words, there was love whenever you were making the grades and making the team, but when you weren't, not so much. And if that's you, I want to encourage you, there's hope, there's healing, there's an invitation to connect to spiritual fathers in this house. 
there's an opportunity to connect to a perfect father who is not just willing to and able to, but is longing to fill that place in your heart that was left void by the absence of a good godly father. Or perhaps in in the extreme or worst cases, even abusive fathers or hurtful fathers or parents. So here's the thing, regardless of your experience, whether you had a good godly father or whether you had something on the whole entire end of the spectrum or something in the middle, regardless of our earthly experience, no earthly father can fill or take the place of a relationship with your heavenly father. And again, this is perhaps one of the places where there is the most power, promise, and potential in your walk of faith. So once again, what are you going to expect? That there's going to be opposition to this. Here's what the enemy does. He uses our earthly experiences to try to affect the filter through which we see God. And, and how we see God doesn't change who he is. He's unchanging, right? He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And he is who, who he is. But what it does is when the enemy introduces these things, again, through maybe um, unfulfilled expectations or painful experiences with our natural, with our biological parents, it causes us to see God through the lens of our pain or, or through the, the unfortunate circumstances. And it doesn't change who God is, but here's what it does. It, it affects our ability to relate to or receive from God. And it hinders us. And, and some of us are crippled because we can't relate to God for who he really is because We've been so hurt or wounded by the experiences on this side of eternity. And my heart today in this message is for you, through these parables that Jesus taught, his heart was, he understood that we would need to hear these kind of teachings so that we could understand more about who God really is. Not who they say he is, not, through, not, not who our experiences kind of indicate that he must be, but who, who he really is, that he's immutably good that he's, he's long-suffering with us, he's patient with us, that he's rich in mercy, that he's abundant in love and kindness, that he's slow to anger, just a few of the things that the Bible has to say about who God really is. So here's what I wanna encourage you with. If you've ever struggled with this, you're in good company. That the disciples even struggled with, with understanding who God is. And, they, and they, they, they desperately desired to see and know the Father for who he was. And John 14, did I tell you to turn there earlier? John 14. And before we dig into the the word a little bit more, let's let's pray. Let's ask God to speak to you today, to speak to us. And come on, turn your heart towards God, right where you sit. Turn your heart towards God. Online church, turn your heart towards God. And ask him where you are, your, your circumstances, your situation, whatever you've come out of, your family background, ask God to speak to you today and, and, and to, to strengthen you, to heal you, to encourage you. And whatever it is that you're going through or what God's calling you to, Father, I just thank you. That's my prayer. It's my fervent prayer, in fact, God, for these precious people, this congregation, this family of God known as Rev City Church, Lord, that you would come and speak to people today, that you would bring healing to hurting hearts, God, that you would bring hope to the hopeless, God, that you would bring strength, fresh faith, uh, renewed courage, God, for the race that you've called us to run, God, for the life of faith that you're inviting us to, God. We invite you. We say, would you come and would you speak to us today, God? Would you make it plain what is on your heart towards us today, God? Would you reveal your heart towards us, Lord, today? Anyone who, in the, within the sound of my voice, Lord, who's hurting or wounded or weary in any area of their life, Lord, bring healing, bring hope, bring freedom, bring strength, bring fe- fresh faith to them today in Jesus' name. Lord, would you use this imperfect person, this imperfect preacher, an imperfect message to reveal in just a greater way, God, the perfect heart of a perfect father in Jesus' name. And come on, all God's people said. Okay, so John 14. If you've ever kind of wrestled or struggled with understanding, with apprehending who God really is, you're in good company. And, and there's this deep longing that's in our hearts. And we'll see that that was this deep longing that was also in the disciples' hearts. And we're really driving to verse 8. But as is becoming our custom, I want to read a little bit more of the word so that you kind of get exposed to the pretext of the word. And, and so also that the word of God will just do some of the preaching for us this morning. And verse 1, God said, Jesus says, rather red letter words, it says, don't let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God and trust in me also. There is more than enough room in my father's house. If it were not so, would I have told you that I'm going to prepare a place for you? And when everything is ready, I will come and get you so that you will always be with me where I am. And you know the way to where I am going. Verse five, no, we do not know, Lord, Thomas said. We have no idea where you're going. So how can we know the way? So 
You remember what the, the, the little moniker that they gave Thomas, remember, when, uh, later on when he would ask to see the wounds and the scars and touch the, the wounds and the scars of Jesus? Remember what we called them, the spirit of religion calls them what? Doubting Thomas, right? So here we see Thomas again. I think that's a bad rap that, that Thomas got. I think he, he's just honest Thomas. <laughs> I think he's just keeping it real Thomas with God. Because I appreciate right here that Jesus says, hey, you guys know where I'm going. You know what's happening. You know what's up here. And Thomas is like, well, back it up a little bit, Jesus. I'm not sure I'm, I'm up to speed on what you're saying to us right here. Let me encourage you with something. God does not despise questions. And God doesn't even uh, uh, despise your, your doubt. If you'll present it to him and say, God, would you just help me understand what you're doing in my life? I don't know that I fully understand what you're doing in my life. I, I, I hear what Pastor T's saying, but God, would you help me to understand? Well, I, I've got some faith, Lord, but would you help me to have some more faith? And, and God is just so good. He doesn't resist those kind of things. Like the spirit of religion would tell you that, that we, I mean, it, I'm glad that Thomas was willing to speak up and to express and say, hey, hey, Jesus, slow down a little bit, expand upon this. And that's exactly what Jesus does. It, it, he goes on, he, he says, okay, okay, keeping it real, Thomas. Here's, let, me, let me expound upon this. He said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. And he says, let me help you understand this. No one's gonna be able to come to the Father except through me. And he says, and if you really know me, you would know who the Father is. And he says, from now on, you do, you do know him, and you have seen him. And Philip said, what? catch this, he says, he says, Lord, show us the Father, and then we will be satisfied. And it's like, I'm sure Jesus is like, Philip, did, were you not listening to what I said to these words that were just coming out of my mouth? And verse 9, it says, Jesus replied, but he was still gracious with them, you know? I mean, he, 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 he said, I, I've been with you all this time, Philip, and yet you still don't know? You still don't see who I am? And watch what he says. He says, anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. So why are you asking me to show him to you? He, because there's this deep need in every one of our lives to know a Father and to know who the Father is. And, and here's what Jesus is saying. He's saying, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. And so don't allow the spirit of religion to say, well, I'm good with Jesus, but, 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 the, but, but allow experiences in life to cause you to think that, the, that your heavenly father is a distant, far off, judgmental, ready to strike you down when you make a bad mistake, uh, uh, holding you at arm's length. He's anything but that because that's what Jesus is saying. He's saying, well, well let, me just read. let me just read what he said. He said, the words I speak are not my own, but my father who lives in me is doing his work through me. And he says, just believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me. Or at least believe because of the work you've seen me do. So they're saying, would you just show us the Father? If we could just see the Father, we'd be satisfied. Then we could just really, I mean, that, that, that would just be the end all for us. If we could just see the Father. And he says, you've, you're seeing him. You're seeing him. And he says, the, what you see me speaking and what you see me doing is a direct result of who my father is. If you've seen me, you've seen the father. So if you've met Jesus in any way, shape, or form in your life, if you've met Jesus, his mercy, his grace, his compassion, his goodness, his forgiveness, if you've seen him, if you've experienced him in your heart, according to Jesus, you've met, you've seen, and you've experienced the father. And he says, I'm a humble servant. I've got compassion. I'm moved with compassion for hurting people. So that's Jesus. That's the Father's heart. That's the Father's heart. Jesus was only doing, only saying, only modeling who the Father really is. He said, when you see me, you've seen the Father. He's the one who heals hurting hearts. He's the one who stoops down into sinful moments with sinners. He's the one that spends time with sinners and tax collectors. He's the one that extends forgiveness and mercy and compassion. And he's the one that brings faith for a better future lived out by faith through a relationship with your heavenly Father, restored through the cross that he was coming to go to. So if you've seen Jesus, you've seen the Father. And the enemy's constantly trying to cause us to believe through our earthly experiences that the Father is distant, far off, heavy-handed. And so, now, now turn to Luke chapter 15. That was John 14, now turn to Luke chapter 15. Luke chapter 15, Jesus, if you go up and read the whole chapter, well, I'll paraphrase most of it, Jesus tells three parables. He tells the parable of the lost sheep, he tells the parable of the lost coin, and he tells the parable of the prodigal son. So all three parables, all this whole chapter, Jesus is dedicating this sermon to helping us understand what the kingdom of God is like and understand more specifically what the heart of the Father is like. 
So the first two parables, to paraphrase, reveal the heart of the Father to search and seek after lost and wayward ones. The third parable shows us the response of the Father to lost and wayward ones when we find our way back home. And so I, I, I paraphrase this almost every week when we give people, precious people, the opportunity to be forgiven of their sins, to say yes to Jesus, and then I also include, I say, but, or maybe you once knew God, loved God, served God, but you've drifted from God, made some bad decisions, you find yourself today far from God. And you hear me paraphrase, and I say, and you're, you're what the Bible would describe as a prodigal son or daughter. And, and, and then you hear me paraphrase when I say, and the, the posture of the Father towards you, if that is you today, is the same today as it was in the parable that Jesus told in Luke chapter 15, and that's what we're about to read. And in verse 11, it says, Jesus continued, and if you've got the New Living Translation, your, your word might say, to, to further illustrate the point. Jesus continued, and he told this third parable that we've labeled the prodigal son. And here's what it says. It says, there was a man who had two sons. There's two sons in the story. Maybe you didn't know that. And the younger one said to his father, father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. Right there, that was already baffling their religious mind and the cultural mind of the day, because most fathers, if, if a son would have come and asked, especially the younger son would have come and asked for his share of the estate while the father was still living, it was, it was akin to, it was equal to the, the son actually wishing that the father was dead. And so in, in the Middle Eastern culture of the day, in the Jewish culture of the day, most fathers would have reacted very harshly and swiftly to shun this son. But, but, but the father in this story actually divides his property between them. And verse 13, it says, and not long after that, the younger son got together all that he had set off for a distant country, and there squandered his wealth in wild living. And after he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in that whole country, and he began to be in need. It's the condition that every one of us has or will find ourselves in if we choose to go and live in our own strength. And we choose to reject relationship with God to go live in the ways of the world. It's, the, it's, it's, just, it's not a matter of if, it's just a matter of when. And it says he, he, he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country who sent him into his field to feed pigs. And again, culturally, in the Jewish tradition of the day, this, this was not just a hard job or a dirty job. This was an unclean job because, because pigs were the most unclean of animals, right? And so it says he longed to fill his own stomach with the pods, with the, the feed that the pigs were eating from the troughs, but no one gave him anything. Verse 17, things begin to turn around when he finally came to his senses. He said, how many of my father's hired servants have food to spare? And here I am starving to death. I will set out and I will go back to my father and say to him, father, I've sinned against heaven. I've sinned against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. So he got up and he went to his father, but while he was still a long way off. It says, while he was still a long way off, his father saw him. Now, you don't see someone who's a long way off unless you are intently watching and looking out for that person. And I don't know what it looked like, but what, God, what Jesus is saying right here is that the father in this parable who represents your heavenly father, I don't know what it looked like in natural and practical terms. According to the parable, maybe every morning that father got up and come on, he put his coffee on and he went out to the front porch of the estate and he was praying and he was asking, he was saying, God, you see, you know, I don't know where he's at, I don't know what he's going through, but you see and you know, and I'm asking you to bring home my wayward son. But whatever it looked like, he was anticipating, he was looking, he was longing for, and day after day and day after day came, it says a long time came, went, but one day there was a figure on the horizon. And watch what it says that the father did. He ran, he ran. His father saw him and was filled with compassion, ran to his son. He ran to his son. He didn't wait for the son to get to the house. He ran to his son. I would imagine when he started the journey of running out there, he probably, if he was a long way off, he couldn't even have been sure that it was the prodigal son. And he ran, and it says he threw his arms around him, he embraced him, he kissed him. The son said to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and against you, and I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, I mentioned it last week, someday I'm going to do a series called Ifs, Ands, and Buts. Because on the other side of ifs, ands, and buts, and God's word, there's oftentimes something powerful that God's up to on the other side of the, the sentence. And he says, I'm no longer worthy. I'm not worthy to be your son. And it says, but the father. 
He said to his servants, quick, bring the best robe, not just any robe, the best robe, and put it on him. And he said, put a ring on his finger, put sandals on his feet, bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. Come on, barbecue was of the Lord. Someone say amen. (laughs) For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and he is found. So they began to celebrate. Remember, though, there were two sons in the story. We haven't heard about the second son yet. Verse 25 picks up his account. And it says, meanwhile, the older son was in the field. And when he came near the house, he heard music and dancing. Come on, that'll kill some Baptist theology right there. (laughs) Music and dancing. Come on, God is not afraid of having fun. Someone say amen. And, And it says he called one of the servants and asked him what was going on. And he says, your brother has come, he replied, and your father has killed the fattened calf because he has him back safe and sound. And and watch what's revealed in the heart. And and, and I'll I'll dig into it here in a minute. There's a reason that Jesus is telling the story from two perspectives. And, And verse 28 says, the older brother became angry, really, and refused to actually go in and join the party. And so his father went out and pleaded with him. I want you to catch that. Went after him and pleaded with him. But he answered his father, look, all these years I've been slaving, I've been serving you, I've never disobeyed your orders, which is probably not true. It was his perspective, his religious perspective. And and, and yet you've never given me even a young goat so I could go celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours who squandered your property with prostitutes, when he comes home, you kill the fattened calf for him. Verse 31, he says, my son, the father said, you're always with me. Everything I have is yours. We had to celebrate and be glad because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and now he is found. So there's two brothers in the story. And and here's what you wouldn't know because we didn't read it. But if you go back and you read the opening of Luke chapter 15, what you will see is that there were actually two groups of people who were listening to Jesus tell the parable. And if you go back and reread it, it says that the sinners and tax collectors and the Pharisees and religious leaders of the day were gathered. Two brothers, two groups. And they represent two common conditions that we can find ourselves in. And and, and two ways that are common ways that people that we tend to search for meaning, significance, or belonging, or purpose in life. The first is self-indulgence, self-discovery, self-gratification. It's, it's sowing wild oats. It's turning from God. It's saying, I don't need God. It's saying, that God thing might be fine for you, but I'm going to go out here and do this for me, myself, and I. And then the second thing is religion. Dry, dead, cold religion, its rules, its rituals. Religion is the story of man's forever frustrated attempt to make ourselves right with and acceptable to God. And Christianity is the story of God's forever successful attempt to make us right with him and bring us back into a relationship with him in a way that we could never earn and never deserve but could only access through the cross of Jesus Christ. And and so the parable is actually about two brothers. And here's the thing. There's the the parable of the, uh, there's the, 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 the prodigal son, the one who went out and lived carelessly and recklessly and selfishly and sinfully. And there's the religious son who probably wasn't perfect, but in his own eyes he was. And who actually began to despise the fact that we would celebrate when some sinner would come into the house. And here's the the unfortunate truth. Both alienate us from God. But both conditions are not aligned with God's will. But here's the good news. Here's the good news. The father, you remember? The father went after both of them. The father ran after both of them. The father ran after the one who had gotten lost in in his sinful living, and the father went and pleaded. Remember what he said? He said, please, come in and be part of this. Be part of what I'm doing. Uh, You've always been here. You've been present. What I have is yours. You're a part of this family. Please don't despise that we're celebrating someone who for years and years has been lost and living their own way. And I'm just telling you, if we want to see revival in Lawrence, Kansas, those of us who have served God for many years or decades are going to have to be willing to embrace and welcome people who get the full portion of salvation through Jesus Christ, a full measure of his goodness and his provision, even though they're just now coming to the Lord. Come on, we got to be ready to receive some prodigal ones in this place. 
and not look at them through with a judgmental stare or a judgmental glare or hold them at arm's length. We got to welcome them and celebrate. The, the Bible says it real clearly that when even one person, one, one that's far away, one of the sheep, that the 99 are here, but when the one comes home, come on, we're going to celebrate all of heaven is rejoicing when even one sinner comes to faith in Christ Jesus. It says the father ran after them. The father pursued both of those sons to try to get them back into that place of grace and that place of celebrating, that place of restoration. And and here's the thing that's interesting. As I studied this chapter throughout the week and kind of read up on it, here's what I, 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 I discovered some things that I didn't even know, that culturally, the fact that the father ran after the wayward one would have been culturally profound to the hearers of the day because it would have been undignified for the patriarch of the Jewish estate to run after someone. Because it involved, it would have had to involve the lifting of the robe and the garments and things that the patriarch of the estate would be wearing. It would uncover his legs, which was undignified. And so the, 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 the hearers of the day would have actually kind of been like, the father went out and ran. He did not send a, a servant, it's the father himself who actually ran out. He didn't just call for someone to go and see who was at the edge of the property. And, and, and he ran to him. And here's the, here's the moral of that little story right there is God is more concerned about you and relationship with you restored. Even when you're in the midst of your sin, Pastor Micah said it, referenced it in the video this morning. While we were still sinners, far lost, far gone in the midst of our darkness. Come on, just one little step onto the property and the father went running to him to embrace him and and welcome him home. The father cares more about relationship with you than he does the religious opinions or traditions of man. And he, he, he broke through all that through Jesus Christ. And remember Jesus saying, if you've seen me, you've seen the father. And Jesus is telling these parables so that we might understand more of who the father is. He's a, he's the God who comes after us. He's the God who, who won't let us stay at the edge of the estate And how many of us, we give our lives to Christ and we just think, well, this is it for me though. I mean, I I just, remember what he said? He said, would you just make me a hired hand? Would you just make me a slave in your house? And, and, And the father wasn't willing to allow the prodigal son to stay in that condition. The father wasn't willing to allow him to stay in that condition. How do we know? Because there's four things that this parable indicate to us that the father did and they all have deep, all four of them have deep, particular meaning about the heart of the Father and his heart for you and for me. Jesus told these parables so that we might understand a, a bit more about who the Father is to us. So remember what he did. He put, it said he put a ring on his finger. He put a ring on his finger. And in biblical days, the ring represented authority and provision. Authority and provision, in this case, restored. And it was early on. I mean, I, I don't know about you, but I might have been like, hey, let's see how you act for a few weeks before we put you back on the bank account. That, that's what this actually was. This signet ring, what it meant is, think about it like Apple Pay today or your debit card that you would loan or give out to your kids. It has your name on it, it's tied to your account, but you're entrusting them. You've authorized them to draw upon your account to make transactions, even though you're not present. You're, they're deputized, they're authorized by the institution. That's what that ring would mean. Whenever you would show up with that ring, on your finger, it would represent that you were authorized to conduct business on behalf of the father and the father's estate. And so right from the start, he's saying, I'm welcoming you back, but you're not gonna just be a slave or a servant. You're fully authorized to access the fullness of my provision, and it's the same with you through Christ Jesus. You know, we, I, I mentioned, I think I mentioned earlier that I was gonna call this message the prodigal father. And because the, the story is about the two sons, but it's also Jesus trying to reveal the heart of the father to us, right? And, and I thought, well, maybe that's kind of a little whatever. And I, but then I, I got convinced that that's what the Holy Spirit was calling me to call it when I dug into the definition of prodigal. And when I'm preaching a message like this, a lot of times I just look for kind of like something deeper, something profound, some little hint or clue that can be found from the definition of this word that we've used to describe this parable. So I went and I looked at the definition like I often do. Here's what I found. Sometimes it's nothing, but, but in this case, it was really profound to me and, and hopefully to you this morning. So 
um, I went and looked at the de definition of prodigal, and if you go look it up, you'll find variations of two definitions stacked right on top of one another that when you read them almost seem like they are canceling each other out or polar opposites. Two definitions that you'll find for the word prodigal. And, and the first definition is this, spending money or resources freely, wastefully, or recklessly. That's where we get the prodigal son. He took the resources that the father had provided for him and given him, and he went and he spent them f freely and recklessly. But then look at, look at definition number two. You'll find it. Go look for yourself. I, I use four or five different uh, 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 dictionaries online to kind of pull this together. Ke check this out. Definition number two, you'll find it for yourself if you went and looked, is this. Having or giving something on a lavish scale. Giving or providing abundantly and Profusely. Synonyms would be generous, lavish, unsparing, bountiful, copious, profuse, rich, and bountiful. You know what's powerful about these two definitions? That both are present in the story of the prodigal son. There's a prodigal son who was wastefully spending his life and his resources, his time, which is something that all of us have a finite amount of. And here's the, the profound truth. Nothing he was spending recklessly was actually even his. Remember, it was all given to him by the Father. And when you're out there sowing your wild oats, living for the world, living for yourself, chasing your own dream, living for your, for your, in your, for your own way, you're actually living on God's time, his breath, his energy, his resources, doing whatever you're doing with his people, whether you know it or not. Because he's a, he's a prodigal father. He's, he, ha he possesses and gives liberally and freely to us. Because here's the concept that's in force today, is the concept of free will. Because the, the, the prodigal, again, he's, Jesus was blowing people's minds when he said, the, the, the youngest son came and said, give me my share that I may go, and the father actually gave it to him. And here, here's the powerful truth, is that if you want to curse God, if you want to leave the faith, if you want to go and live in the world, if you want to leave the church, if you want to forsake your faith, if you want to leave the fellowship, God, God will let you do it. And here's, here's why it's powerful, import, powerfully important. Because people say, well, why, why would God allow these things to happen or whatever? Because if we did not have free will, there would be no choice. And where there is no choice, there's only control. And where all there is is control, there is not love. Because love that is forced or coerced or manipulated isn't really love. And God gives you a choice. He says, Who, you choose to stay. Whom are you going to serve? And the choice that you have every day is, am I going to take the time, the breath, the life, the people, the influence, the opportunity that God's given to me, and am I going to live it in a way that is reckless and careless, or am I going to live it in a way that is faithful and fervent and stewarding and, and furthering the purposes of God from my life and being a blessing to people around me? It's the decision that we have every day. The story is about a prodigal son, but it's also about a prodigal father. He, he, he gives on a lavish Skill by his divine power. Second Peter 1 3, God has given us everything we need to live a godly life. We've received all of this by coming to know him, the one who called us to himself by means of his marvelous glory and excellence. Good fathers are providers, not enablers. And, and, and God is a provider to us. He's, he, he, he's always looking to provide. And he'll, you, our choice is, again, what are we going to do with what he provides? Again, the time, the resources, the people that he has put in our life. The second thing that he did is he, so he put that royal ring on his finger. He said, this represents that you're going to have full authority and full uh, provision. Whatever I have and whatever I have access to is now yours. The second thing that he put on him was a royal robe, and the robe represents royalty and relationship restored. There were likely different special colors that, that, that represented the family that he was a part of, and he was saying, I'm not just allowing you to come back as a servant or as a slave. I'm restoring you back to full relationship with me. And, and he said, I'm, I'm not just going to let you come back and just kind of be a servant. I want, to, I want the fullness of relationship with you. And, and, and good fathers are present, not passive. And time is the currency of relationship. Time is the currency of relationship. It's really true. If you kind of show me how much time you're spending with a person or how much time you're spending with the Lord, I can kind of, to relative accuracy, predict the, the, the level of importance of that relationship to your life. And here's what I wanted to encourage you with today is that your children, fathers, hear me today, your children need you to be present in their life.
And I know that he's called you to go and work and serve and do and build, but don't do it at the expense of your family or your children. Because what we, live in, what we leave rather in the next generation matters far more than what we leave for the next generation. Because you can leave them with a mountain of money and a soul that is void and empty and despair. And, and many have spent their life, hear me, I'm just encouraging you, men of God. I know I acknowledged it. You're called to be, to live daringly and live adventurously and go and build something and go and be a blessing and go and do something great with your life. God does not despise those things, but he wants you to partner with him and he wants you to make sure that while you're doing it, you're keeping in mind one of the key responsibilities of your life, which is to be a father who is present for your wife and for your kids. Many have spent the life, their life climbing the ladder of success only to realize at the end of it all that that ladder they were climbing was leaning upon the wrong wall. He said, I'm putting a robe on you because you're coming back into relationship with me, fellowship with me, full restoration. And remember, it's more than just a story. It's what God does for you and me through Christ Jesus. Number three, I'm gonna move quick. The sandals, he puts sandals on his feet. Sandals represent peace in the Bible. For shoes, Ephesians 6 says, put on the peace that comes from the good news, the gospel, so that you will be fully prepared and it's not just this temporal peace. There is a peace, the Bible says. Jesus said, my peace I give you, my peace I leave to you, not as the world gives you. Part of the inheritance that we have access to, that authority, that access to that provision is a sense of peace that transcends our understanding, that goes beyond temporal peace that we can find in the things that are fleeting in this world. But it's, it's a peace with God. It's a peace with God. And we find this in Romans 5 where it says, we have been made right with in God's sight by faith, and we have peace with God. How? Because of what Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior, has done for us. Because of this faith, Christ has brought us into a place of undeserved privilege where now we stand with feet fitted with the shoes of peace. Lastly, he called and said, hey, bring that fattened calf out. And let's throw a party. Let's throw a celebration. It represents that God is willing to give his first and his best because culturally they would have understood, wait a minute, that's not supposed to happen today. That's set aside, set apart. That's for a future celebration. That's for only the, the most important moments in the life of this family. And it's God saying that when you came to Christ or today when you give your heart to Christ, that that's the kind of celebration that's going to go on in heaven. And it's God saying that he was willing to give as a father his first and his best. Colossians 1 verse 15 says that Christ is the visible image of the invisible God. He existed before anything, so he's first. And he is supreme over all creation. He's the best. And, and he's the one that God the Father sent to make a way to bring us back home into relationship with him. Reading on, it says, verse 19, it says, for God in all his fullness was pleased to live in Christ. And through him, through him, God the Father reconciled everything, you and me, to himself. He made peace with everything, you and I, in heaven and on earth by means of Christ's blood. This includes you who were once far away from God. You once were his enemies separated from him, by evil thoughts and actions, and now he's reconciled you to himself through the death of Christ, brought you into his own presence, made you holy, made you blameless as you stand before him without a single fault. That's how God sees you. Did you know that? Righteousness is not just good Christian behavior. The Bible says that you are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. The oldest son culturally, as I kind of read and dug into this parable, one of the things that I studied and found out was that culturally it would have been typically the responsibility of the oldest son, the, the big brother, to, to go after the younger brother and to come on, bring him back to his senses, kind of shake some sense into him and bring him back home. Jesus is that big brother, the firstborn of all creation. And where this imperfect brother kind of botched it in this parable, Jesus was setting the stage to 
He kind of left it like kind of a cliffhanger, but what we know now in the hindsight of eternity and biblical history is that Jesus was the one who was coming to make a way that the prodigal ones, the lost ones, could come back home. And when God brings you back home, he doesn't bring you back home to be a slave or a servant. He brings you back home to have a ring on your finger, a robe on your back, full authority, full provision, full relationship, restored. And there's a celebration, come on, when even one lost person comes back home. Would you stand to your feet? And I can think of no better time than Father's Day for some wayward ones, prodigal sons and daughters to come back home to your heavenly Father in this room and joining us online. I hope that now what I paraphrase every week now, maybe if you're new to this story, kind of in the fullness and the context, maybe we'll mean even more to you as we encourage people that if that's you, you, you once knew God, loved God, served God, but you've drifted from God, made some bad choices, maybe bad decisions, or for whatever reason, you just find yourself today far from God. That today, the posture of, the heavenly, of your heavenly Father towards you is the same as it was in Luke chapter 15 with that prodigal one. He's looking, he's longing, he's hoping, he's eagerly anticipating, expecting the day when you will come to the end of yourself, the end of your friends, the end of your funds, finally come to your senses and realize, man, I, I'd be better off to just be a servant in the house of God. But now you know that he's not content with just leaving you as a servant. He wants to bring you back into full relationship, authority, provision for your life. And all that son had to do is just take a step he was far off. And for us, in this context, what we encourage, what we challenge, what we invite you to do, if that's you, or maybe you've never put your faith in Christ, this invitation is for you as well. And that little small step that we ask you to take is a simple but powerful outward sign of the inward work God's doing in your heart. And it's just this. It's just, would you lift your hand right now if that's you? If you've drifted from God, if you're far from God, if you need to come back home, if you need a fresh start, if you need a new start, if you want a new life in Christ, to be born again, all the old things, the Bible says, passed away. You become a new creation when you respond in faith to the free gift that's given by grace. And if that's you right now, don't, don't delay. Lift your hand high towards heaven. Thank you, Lord, for these precious people. Thank you, Lord, for the precious people I trust online that are also coming back home to a relationship with their heavenly Father. If you raised your hand, you can lower it, and here's what we're going to do. We're going to pray this prayer with you. We do it every week, and we want you to hear the sound of, of brothers and sisters who are not going to be judgmental or hold you at arm's length. We understand. We understand that we were once right where you are today, and we're going to welcome you. Come on. We're going to help you. We're going to encourage you. You stumble and fall. We're going to help you get up and keep moving. We, we had people that helped us with that very thing in our walk of faith. And so come on, let's pray this prayer with these people so that they hear the sound of a church family. And it also, again, every week it reminds us that we don't graduate from grace. We don't graduate from grace. Everything God's gonna ever do and build in our life, it's all built on that foundation. So come on, some amazing people came home to Christ today. Repeat this after me. Come on, say it with some fresh, maybe boldness and passion. Say, Father, in Jesus' mighty name. I recognize my need for a savior. And I thank you for sending Jesus to pay the price that I could never pay, to make a way that I might have a new life and a fresh start. And I give you my life, and I give you my trust. And because of Jesus, I'll never be the same. Now, come on, join with heaven and rejoice with all of heaven. Come on. Man, God is so good. Happy Father's Day to you dads and to all you men. And don't forget that we serve a God who is looking and longing and always ready to welcome us back home. Even on our worst day, even in our darkest hour, he is longing for a relationship with you. That's the heart of the gospel. Jesus came to make a way that 
we might be welcomed back home. Isn't that good news? Aren't you grateful for the good news of Jesus Christ and what he's done in your life? Hey, let's worship the Lord one more time. We're going to sing this song that just reminds us that we serve a good father. And as we sing it today, my hope, my heart, my prayer for you is that whatever perspectives you maybe have had that have hindered you or held you back from relating to and receiving from your heavenly father, from the perspective and the reality of who he really is, he's good, he's faithful, he's long-suffering, he's got a hope, he's got a plan, he's got a future for you. My hope, I mean, really my fervent prayer is that through this moment, that who he really is to you, any of the lies or the deceptions or the walls that the enemy has built around your heart or your mind towards God the Father would be broken down by his great love for you today. Would be broken down by his great love for you today. I love you. He loves you. Come on, let's worship our good, good Father one more time. Then my precious wife will come and dismiss you.
Man, what an incredible time of worship. What a powerful message, the prodigal father. Man, we hope you enjoyed that worship today and the service, a powerful message on this Father's Day. Listen, if you dedicated your life to Jesus Christ, we are so proud of you. And we're grateful that you made a decision to follow after our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And so we want to partner with you. And to do that, we want to present to you and send to you a Fresh Start Bible. So if you'll do me a favor, if you raise your hand uh, during the service, uh, at the end of the service, when Pastor Thomas talked about the prodigal son and the prodigal father, then you can do me a favor and text the word Rev City to the number 94,000. Tell us that you dedicated your life to Jesus Christ and we will put in the mail a Fresh Start Bible. Now, in order to do that, we have to have your address, your home and mailing address and things like that. So fill out that form and then we'll get that Fresh Start Bible sent to you on Tuesday morning. And I'm so, one of the best things that I get to do all week is send those Bibles out to people. And so please be sure and you do that. Listen, if you're a guest here today, thank you so much for joining Rev City Online. We hope that you enjoyed the service. We hope that you've also felt like you're connecting to us. And again, you can use that same text feature, Rev City to 94000. The number one feature is say, I want to connect, and that will just get you involved with our church so that we can reach out to you and make you feel welcomed and cared for, and then also give you updates on what's happening here at Rev City. And again, as I said at the very beginning, to make you feel a part of a church family, like you are a church family, even though you're remote and you're not physically here on the campus. Well, listen, we're, we're going to close the service today, but I want to I want to tell you something. Thank you so much for joining us today. Have a great week. Have a great Father's Day. Enjoy the good time with your father, spiritual fathers or fathers to be. Enjoy today's day. We love you guys and we hope to see you next week. Same time, same place right here on Rev City Online. God bless you guys.